so um, I'm going to be talking about uh, go to there and back again. I, I spent a lot of time looking at the future of programming and trying to figure out how we get there and, and listening to where we think we are and where we think we should be going. And sometimes where we as a community think we should be going is a place we've already been. And sometimes that's because we don't know what we're doing. We, we don't know where we've been before, so we're doing it again. And sometimes it's because previously we didn't know what we were doing and we moved away from the right thing to the wrong thing. And sometimes we're just going in circles. And it's hard to tell the difference between those unless you have some understanding of the history of this stuff. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. We have this magical notion that the way we make progress is we're waiting for someone to make a basic discovery and then everybody immediately recognizes it and we all follow and it all becomes great and it never happens like that. What happens is a fundamental discovery is made and nobody pays any attention to it and if they do, they're completely hostile and resistant to it and there's a lot of arguing and, and maybe 10 or 20 or 40 years later, people will start to pick it up. That happens all the time. I'll show you examples of that tonight. So we imagine, or progress does not wait for the next good idea. It waits for consensus on an old idea. In fact, it's been a long time since we've had good new ideas. So I'm gonna start uh, with this guy. Does anybody recognize this guy? This is Edsger Dijkstra. Dijkstra. Um, a Dutch, maybe the first Dutch computer programmer, uh, famous Dutch computer scientist. In 1972, the ACM awarded him the Turing Award, which is their biggest award. And when you get the Turing Award, you're invited to give a talk. And so this is Dijkstra in San Francisco giving his Turing Award talk, which was named The Humble Programmer. It's a really interesting talk. At the time, he says a lot of things which were controversial in the day, most of which is true, um, and which we can see now. So it's kind of amazing to see how far ahead he was. He got a few things wrong, but he got quite a lot of stuff right. So he, he was given the award because of the, the work he had done. He did work in programming languages. He was on the Algol 60 committee the best language design by committee in the history of the universe. Uh, he did work in operating systems, in uh, uh, mutual exclusion. We can work with threads because of the work that he did with semaphores. He, he worked out the theory of that. He did the first uh, concurrent garbage collector. He did a lot of work on formal proofs. I will get more of that a little bit later. But the thing he is most famous for is he wrote a letter. He wrote a lot of letters, but he's remembered for one particular letter that he wrote in 1968 and submitted to the editor of the communications of the ACM. The editor accepted the letter and printed it with this title, Go-To Statement Considered Harmful. This letter started an argument which lasted literally for decades. And it wasn't a trivial argument, like it's you know one silly feature in a programming language, how upsetting could that be? This was a fairly violent, deeply emotional argument. So because it's so important, I want to read to you the first two sentences of his letter. And I'm going to read it without the funny Dutch accent. Instead, I'll use my funny American accent. But you can try to imagine a, a crazy Dutchman saying this. For a number of years, I've been familiar with the observation that the quality of a programmer of programmers is a decreasing function of the density of go-to statements in the programs they produce. Already, he's, he, he starts with a really arrogant tone, okay? He could be saying that programs with fewer go-to statements seem to be better, but he's not saying that. He says the programmers who use go-to are, are inferior to everybody else. So he's making it personal from the beginning. He's just being mean for no, no reason. Um, Alan Kay once said that arrogance is measured in nanodextras. <laughs> but he goes on. More recently, I've discovered why the use of the go-to statement has such disastrous effects. Now, we're only halfway through the second sentence, and already we've, we've leaped from an observation about quality decreasing to disastrous. Okay, he's... He's a drama queen, right? He's, he's way over the top on something. 
uh, he may have the facts behind him on the, the decreasing quality thing, but then he leaps to this other thing he's, he's just blaming here. And then, um, and I became convinced that the go-to statement should be abolished from all higher level programming languages. And that's what started the argument. This was the first time someone had identified a bad part in a programming language and recommended not just not using it, but eliminating it. That we don't trust people to make good choices as to whether or not to use it. It's best just to get rid of it. Hugely emotional debate. So uh, Dijkstra represented the radicals. And the radicals said, it's a disaster. They're, they're all drama queens. They're all talking about how terrible the go-to was. There had been recent research which suggested that if you add else and while to your programming language, that eliminates most of the need for go-to. And new languages were starting to accept those features. So let's, while we're at it, let's get rid of the go-to. Um, on the other side were the reactionaries. Because whenever you got radicals, you're going to have reactionaries. The reactionary said, well, wait a minute. Uh, while and else get rid of some of the need for go-to, but not all of it. We still need the go-to. Uh, we need it for performance. There are certain cases where in order to get our programs to go fast, we have to be able to jump from here to there, and there's no other way we can do it. Anything else is going to degrade performance. Um, and we have this tradition. We have always had go-to in programming languages for generation. Well, not for generations, because there only been one generation of programmers up to this point. But they still felt pretty strongly about it. They can't take this away from us. It's an essential tool. It's how we do our work. It's how we express ourselves. We need the freedom to write programs the way we see fit. You cannot take that freedom away from us. Um, and, and then they started talking about pride. And they might have had a case here, because Dijkstra was saying, we don't trust you guys to make good choices as to whether to use it. And they say, well, that's, you know, we're insulted. We, of course, we should be trusted. We should be allowed to, to make these choices. Um, and then the argument gets numerical, um, or attempts to, doesn't really. Uh, they said, you know, nobody wants to eliminate the go-to, which is obviously wrong, because the reason they're making that statement is because somebody said, we think we should, and so that's someone else, right? So numerically, that argument makes no sense. Some slightly smarter reactionary said, the majority of us don't want to get rid of the go-to. And they said that without any research to justify that statement. They just assume, you know, we don't want it, therefore the majority doesn't want it. Um, and they continued to make that argument even after they were no longer the majority. That's the way those arguments go. But in all of that, they completely lost sight of what should have been the central topic in this debate, which is, what's the best way to write programs? We're trying to write programs that are free of error. What are the best conventions for doing that? The radicals are saying, let's get rid of the go-tos, because they observe that the more go-tos you have, the lower quality you have. So if you reduce go-tos to zero, then maybe you'll get the best programs. The counter arguments completely missed that. They talked about virtually everything else. None of them talked about quality. Then when you've got radicals and reactionaries, you always have moderates, right, who say, now, now, let's be the voice of reason. Let's, let's look at both sides. Um, and the moderates agreed with the radicals that we should avoid go-to wherever possible. But they agreed with the reactionaries in that we shouldn't get rid of it. You know, we'll keep it for those special emergencies where you really have to be able to go to somewhere, but let's not get rid of it. That's, that's, that's too far. We, we, we can't take that step. It turned out the radicals were right. Um, they were wrong in the language that they used. Um, the, the flaming rhetoric was clearly wrong. Uh, that, that case was not met. But they were right on the facts. That is that we didn't need go-to, and getting rid of it would improve things. Not a whole lot. It didn't prevent, prevent disasters. In fact, here in the future, without go-to, we still see plenty of software disasters. So that was not at least the sole cause. But um, eventually, we all agreed that, yeah, we'll get rid of the go-to. And it took a long time in violent argument through the whole time. So let's look at it um, chronologically. It starts in 1968 when Dijkstra writes his letter. Actually, someone suggested to Dijkstra in 1959, 
yeah, let's get rid of the go-to. And at the time, it made no sense to Dijkstra. So what? I mean, he didn't understand it. Nine years later, he finally accepted the wisdom of that suggestion, and he became a champion of it. Um, around that time, just after um, Dijkstra publishes his letter, Dennis Ritchie starts working on the C programming language. And Ritchie is a moderate. In his own code, he doesn't use GoTo very much, but he puts GoTo in the language. Uh, a few years later, C++ is created. It has GoTo in the language. Another 10 years go by, Java happens. And Java does not have a GoTo, and it gets accepted. Now, Java is not the first language without a go-to, but it's a watershed. It's an, an important mark, because before Java, it was unusual for a language to not have go-to. After Java, it was a language, it was unusual, unusual for a language to have a go-to. So that, that's a pretty clear dividing line. And yet, Java has go-to as reserved word. And that's because there was a concern, if we got this wrong, in Java 1.1, we want to slip a go-to in. You know, if it turns out the market says, no, no, no we've got to have it. So even then, they weren't sure. So since then, we've had almost 20 years of living with these languages without go-to, and it's working. And pr most of you have probably never used a language which had a go-to, and you don't understand what this debate is about. But this is how progress is made in the computer industry. We like to think that we are totally innovative, that we're constantly turning stuff over. And, and we are. We're constantly doing trivial improvements. But the really important improvements take at least a generation to accomplish. And mostly that's because we're waiting for people to die. And once they're gone, then we can make progress. So if this was an example of a paradigm shift. Uh, and usually you think of a paradigm shift as being a fairly important thing. And this one, what could be more trivial than one statement which says, go over there? Um, but it took a paradigm shift to get this done. And in paradigm shifts, um, the thing that characterizes them is that um, in order to understand the, the debate, you have to have had some kind of experience. There's something which changes your perception about what's being argued about. And this is one of those cases where Dijkstra and his followers understood the benefit of not having go-to. And so they would argue about it, and the people they were arguing with had not had that experience, and so they did not understand the case they were making. But they understood all of the words and understood the subject matter, and so they assumed that they did. And so they spent decades arguing with each other, one side making arguments that the other side couldn't understand. And we don't understand why well, you don't understand. And it was just going on forever. And it turns out we do this, we humans, not just us programmers, but we humans do this all the time. So in software, I've seen this, um, a lot of the paradigm shift arguments take this form. I have never blank, so I don't see why blank. Like, um, I have never needed recursion, and I'm a very successful programmer not understanding recursion, so you're saying we need recursion, I don't understand why we need that. So as long as you've got those guys in the world, you don't make progress. And I've, I've seen this argument made time and again. I've seen really smart people make this argument. I don't understand why we need interactivity. Punch guards are just fine. I don't understand why we need GUIs. Command lines are just fine. I don't understand why, why we need closure. I don't understand why we need continuation passing. I've never needed them. So therefore, then they can't possibly be important. And so that tends to hold things up. So before we go any further, I have to make a confession. Um, I'm going to show you a bug that, that I made. This is my bug. So it's time for a bug story. So in 2001, I wrote a Java package for processing JSON, which is the world's best loved data interchange format. And this Java package was a reference implementation to show people how easy it was to implement JSON processors. And uh, a lot of people have used it. I didn't intend it for production. I intended it to be a reference implementation. But it works, and it's solid, and um, it's got a lot of users. And in it, I had this declaration, private int index. So I had a variable called index, 
which counted the number of characters being parsed. And it was used to generate error messages. So if the parser found a syntax error someplace, it would use this number to tell you where in your text the error occurred. So you could go in and patch it. So I did that in um, 2001. In 2000, or in last year, I got a bug report from somebody. It turned out that they had a JSON text which was several, meg several gigabytes in size, which is something I never anticipated. When I started, when I came up with JSON, I, a, a large message was a few K, you know, so I, it just never occurred to me how many orders of magnitude bigger they could get. At, at that time, two gigabytes was a pretty big disk drive, right? And I couldn't imagine anyone consuming an entire disk drive for one JSON message. It just, I, it was unimaginable. Last year, someone did it. They, they, um, they had something that big. I think they just took a database and turned it into JSON and then tried to parse it back, which is, I can't recommend anybody do that. I think it's crazy. Um, but it turned out they had a syntax error in some of the outer gigabytes. And so uh, when this went to report the error, instead of telling them where it was, it was off by a couple billion, which is kind of a big error. Um, and it happened because Java gave me a choice. It said, do you want an int there? Do you want a short? Do you want a long? What do you want that to be? I thought, I want an int. That's a pretty good size for that. Uh, it turned out I was wrong. Um, every other aspect of my program was resilient in the face of these gigantic uh, payloads. There was, this was the only vulnerability in the program, and so that caused that weird error. Um, and it's because of int. So this is something, int is, the way we understand int today comes out of the 50s. So the early computers were made out of vacuum tubes and relays and stuff. They were incredibly primitive machines by modern standards. Uh, those components were very expensive, consumed a lot of space, a lot of power. A computer could, a single computer would easily fill this room. They, they were huge and very unreliable because the tubes would burn out very frequently um, because you had such an enormous number of tubes in them. Um, the likelihood that at any second one of them will burn out was pretty high, so it was hard to keep the machines up. So if you were a, if you were designing a central processing unit, you would try to figure out how to use as few gates as possible, because the more gates you put in it, the more it's going to cost to build, the more it's going to cost to operate, the more it's going to cost to maintain, and the less reliable, reliable it will be. Someone had an epiphany that if we use complement representation of numbers, then we don't have to imp implement subtract. We can just use add and complement and ignore the overflow, and it does the same thing, and we save some gates. Brilliant, right? So computers started using one's complement or two's complement arithmetic because they had that property. Um, but it does this terrible thing that when you have a number that's too big to store in a cell, what happens? Well, first, let's look at what would you like to have happen. There are a number of reasonable things you might do. One is you throw an exception. You know, it doesn't fit, boom, you know, stop the program. Something's terribly wrong. Or another thing you might do is uh, store a NAN or some other representation for something which is an error, which will propagate through the rest of the computations, and you can discover at the end, you know, something went wrong. That'd be okay. Another possibility would be to do saturation. Um, take the biggest possible value and we'll clip it to that. So that's something that's useful in signal processing and computer graphics. They would rather saturate than go crazy. What we do instead is probably the worst possible thing. Whereas we flip the bit and suddenly it goes wildly negative. And, it, and you can't even predict which wildly negative value it's going to be. So you can't even easily test for it. It just suddenly goes crazy. It made sense in the 50s, and we can't stop doing it. Um, so our languages do these crazy things with ints. I hate ints, but ints are wildly popular, and we're hearing from people all the time saying, we need to add ints to JavaScript. We want JavaScript to, to have that ridiculous behavior. 
Um, another problem with ints is that they come in a variety of sizes. And there was a time when that was a really important thing. Uh, memory used to be really expensive, really scarce. Uh, one of the most impoverished environments I ever saw was the Atari 2600, the VCS. Everybody remember the, the home video computer? It had 128 bytes of RAM. I said that correctly, 128 bytes of RAM. So um, if you're writing a game, you had to be very, very careful about how you declared each of those variables because they were all going to cost. You only had, a, had 128 of them, and that included your stack. Okay, So th those guys were heroes. Man. They, that was some amazing programming that they did. And also on, on that machine, adding a 64-bit number would take eight times longer than adding an 8-bit number. So it made sense to, to have the smaller types. It doesn't make sense anymore. So um, today we've got CPUs which um, can add 64 bits at the same speed as 8 bits. And we've got gigabyte memories. You know, having the opportunity, I want to save a byte on this variable, doesn't make any sense. That is a total waste of time. Just the, the mental time it takes, what type should I make that variable? It's costing you money, right? You're, that's not a decision you need to think about anymore. But it's built into our languages. So Java's got byte, short, int, long, float, double. Having all of those choices means you have opportunities to choose the wrong one and to cause bugs to happen for no other reason except that they offered you the choice and you made the wrong one. The correct choices are long or double depending on the application. All of the other ones are wrong. Now, JavaScript, on the other hand, offers you one choice, and it's number. That's the right answer. One is the right answer. By offering you only one number type, you cannot pick the wrong one, right? That's good. That makes JavaScript a more reliable language, at least in that consideration, than almost all of the other languages. And yet, we still get a lot of passionate demand saying, we want that. We want those in JavaScript. Basically, what it means is, we hate JavaScript, and we don't want to be writing in JavaScript. We'd rather be writing in Java or something else. So please make JavaScript more like Java so we can simply ignore it and pretend it's something else. And we don't want to do that. So JavaScript made the right choice. Unfortunately, the one number type that it chose was the wrong one. And it's, it's hard to blame JavaScript for that because every language designed in the last 20 years made the same bad choice. And the bad choice was binary floating point. And it's mostly Intel's fault, although it existed long before them. So um, Intel made it popular in the 8087, a little floating point chip, and then got incorporated into the Pentiums, and it's now um, standard equipment all the CPUs. And so everybody uses it because it's there and it's free. But it's got this problem. It cannot accurately represent decimal numbers, which is a problem if you live on a planet that uses the decimal system. Because we all represent our money with decimal fractions. And binary floating point cannot accurately represent those. And when you add up people's money, they have a reasonable expectation you're going to get the right sum. And that's really hard to do with this number. It's the wrong number. So um, in the 50s, there were two completely separate spheres of computing. There was the scientific community and there was the business community. The scientific community had Fortran, they had floating point, they didn't care about money, they were completely impractical guys, they were after answers, right? And then the business guys, totally into money, didn't care about anything else. They used BCD, binary coded decimal, so they could accurately represent all of the number quantities. And the Scientific guys would never use BCD. The business guys would never use floating point. They used separate languages, sometimes separate operating systems, even separate hardware. It was two different worlds. Eventually, the scientific world won. So virtually all of our modern languages are descendants of uh, Fortran, and they got the binary floating point. Um, and the business side died, even though business is the most important sphere of computing now. You know, most people are doing IT where they're counting money um, using the wrong languages. So Java has 
displaced COBOL as the principal business language, and it's really badly suited to that because it has binary floating point and not what it really should have is decimal floating point. So a few years ago, uh, IBM was proposing a format that was adopted by the IEEE for doing decimal floating point, and it was an insanely complicated, ridiculously baroque format. Um, and they tried to force it on JavaScript because they recognized how important JavaScript was becoming, and they thought if we can force it into JavaScript, that means it's forced into every machine in the world that's got a web browser in it, and they can get it out everywhere. They can get the ubiquity that they needed. Um, so they, they tried to force it on, on PC39, and I was in favor of it because of the problems we have with binary floating point. The problem was the format that they came up with was so ridiculously complicated that a software emulation of the format, which is something we'd need while we're waiting for Intel to get the chips out and then waiting another decade for them to get fully implemented, we'd have to be in the software simulator, which would be 200 times slower. And at that time, the, um, the JavaScript engine makers said, no way, because they were in this battle to try to make it go fast, right? They're trying to make JavaScript run as fast as C. And there's no way they can accomplish that if suddenly the numbers become 200 times slower. Now, in, in fact, I don't think they would feel that much pain because most of what we're doing in JavaScript, most of the time we're doing integers. And you could have optimizations for integers. You know, if, if, the thing, if we know the thing's an integer, then do the fast thing, don't do the slow thing. Um, and I think that would get rid of most of the 200, but occasionally you can hit the slow path and boom, and nobody wanted to do that, so we rejected it. And IBM was not willing to, to compromise on the format, um, so we couldn't discuss it, other possibilities, and so we left it out. So JavaScript still has a binary floating point. So I thought about it for a while, and this is how I think we fix it. I, I call this format DEC64. There are other things called DEC64, but you should forget all about those, and, and this is the one. So it's a 64-bit uh, format. We've got an 8-bit exponent and a 56-bit coefficient. To convert an integer into one of these, you shift it 8 bits. The exponent being 8 bits um, is trivial to unpack, and, and in fact, on Intel machines, unpacking is free. It costs zero instructions because they can load a, a byte out of the low order eight bits. The thing that makes it work is we've got 10 there instead of two, which is the secret to the decimal system. It's got tens in it, and not twos in it. And, and this will give you more precision than we have in our current uh, double format. Um, we don't have quite the range in the exponents. It only goes to 100 and something. But, uh, you know, and the current format can go up to 310. Has anyone ever seen a, a reasonable, uh, something that wasn't an error that came out anywhere close to 310? No. Um, so I, I think this would work. Um, it's fast to emulate in software. Um, the fast path for doing additions is only five instructions. Um, pretty fast. You can't do binary floating point in, in five instructions. So that's pretty good. Um, so if any of you work at Intel, I don't know, you need to do this. We need, it, we need this in our chips. This should be the one format in all future programming languages. You know, we, we don't need a choice there. We're better off just having one format that works well. So while we're talking about arithmetic, one of the awful parts in JavaScript is the plus operator. And the reason it's awful is because it does both addition and concatenation. This was something that was borrowed from Java. In Java, it's not quite so bad because Java is strongly typed, so you can predict which one it's going to do. But JavaScript is loosely typed, so it's not until you go to execute that it decides if it's going to add or concatenate. That turns out to be a source of errors. It, we see it a lot, especially in web applications. So a few years ago, I proposed um, this for ES4. I said, let's get a concatenation operator. So let's say it's tilde, because it looks like a, a string. You know, so we concatenate strings with tilde. And all it does is, is concatenation. 
And then we'll wait a few years, we'll have the winters and the IDEs warn people if they're using PLUS to do concatenation, fix your programs. And then after some period of time, we'll fix JavaScript and we'll say from now on, PLUS adds and that's all. And if we do this, then it'll only take a generation or so, but once we do, we'll get rid of this bug and, and the language will be more reliable. The committee said, no, we, we can't depend on taking that much time to, to do something that's not realistic. Since then, um, two other uh, motivations for doing this have happened. One is WAT. It turns out it's really fun to uh, point out stupid things that JavaScript does and say, WAT? It, it's like a thing now on the internet. And um, the people who maintain the, the ECMAScript language are really annoyed by that and kind of embarrassed and like, what? And, and, and they'll defend some of the things like, well, that's actually a conversion of, you know, they're what? So we can, this is one of them. One, one of the sources of what is the crazy things that Plus does. So we can fix that. We can get rid of it so that when you do something stupid with Plus, it says nan, and as a, oh, you know, that's not that. So that'd be good. Um, so it'd be less embarrassing. The other thing is that we're trying to make the language faster now. A few years ago, we didn't have much ambition to make JavaScript fast. It, that didn't appear to be its mission, but now it looks like it's actually going to become a high performance language. And this is really bad for the engine makers because they've still got this problem. They would like to generate a machine instruction which is gonna do the add, boom, and go really fast because that's the fastest theoretical path you can have. And they can't do it because of this crazy behavior that they have to be prepared to emulate. So the other justification for doing this is someday the machines will go faster. Um, one other bit of information, the um, editor of the ECMAScript standard, Alan Worfsprock, who works for Mozilla, brilliant guy, um, he has said that he thinks JavaScript has another 40 years of life in it, which I think is appalling. Um, you know, most of you are going to be dead and we're still going to have JavaScript, and that's, that's just creepy. Um, so if he's right, then maybe it's appropriate to take the long view. So like, yeah, maybe it'll take 20 years to fix this, but yeah, we got time, you know, so let's do that. Um, yeah, I, I hope it doesn't take um, 40 years to, to replace this language. I hope we can do it a lot quicker than that. Although um, I've suggested that, um, you know, worst case scenario, JavaScript is the last programming language. And, and that, that's, that's really scary. So um, Alan's prediction is much, much more optimistic than mine is. Um, so I was mentioning Dijkstra early on in his talk and the, the thing that he got wrong in his talk. Um, there was a lot of concern at that time about the correctness of programs. And um, they uh, learned very early on that testing did not give us the level of reliability that we needed. That tests can only prove the existence of bugs, tests cannot prove the absence of bugs. And that's what we really need to know. And testing doesn't work. It can give us some confidence, but it cannot tell us that the, the code is bug free. It just can't do that. They recognized that in the 60s, and it's still true. So what they thought to do instead, all being good mathematicians, was let's prove that the programs are true in the same way that a mathematician might try to prove that an equation is true. You know, you'll design a proof which will show that for all values, this equation um, does not do anything that's incorrect. Um, so they spent a lot of time thinking about how to write those sorts of proofs of correctness. And in his talk, Dijkstra suggests that the idea that first you write the program, then you write the proof for the program, that's no good. It should be part of the program itself. So he was suggesting that um, a feature of a programming language would be um, a, a proof language in which you would talk about the program itself in the program, sort of... Um, mathematical commentary, so that when you write a, a do loop, 
you will also write the proof that the do loop is going to terminate. Now, I, I think what he's suggesting is way too weak, right? You don't want to know if the do loop terminates. You want to know if the do loop produces the right result. But that's really hard. So um, he's already reduced it to a much simpler problem, which is the halting problem, which is also already provably unsolvable. And that's sort of where they get stuck. Um, they, they're, it turns out that the proof is so much more complicated than the program. And even then, because we don't know how to correctly specify, we still don't know if it's bug free or not. Uh, Donald Knuth made a joke of this situation in a comment in one of his programs. He said, beware of bugs in the above code. I've only proved it correct, not tried it. So when proofs of correctness failed, um, there was despair. You know, how do we go on? We can't write programs with just tests. That'd be insane. We've got, you know, too much is depending on this. Um, so there was an idea that maybe we could use types. Maybe types are the answer. Maybe types can do what proofs couldn't do. Um, types come out of a, a problem that Fortran had. Inside of one memory cell, in, in one word, you've got some number of bits, but the bits can be interpreted in many ways. It might be a floating point number, or it might be a binary number, or it might be several binary numbers, or it might be some characters, or it might be an instruction. You need something to tell you what those bits mean, because it, it matters. And so in Fortran, they did it by putting types on the variables. You'd say, this variable is real, or this variable is integer, or this variable is character. And then the compiler knows what the types are and start giving you warnings if you put a real thing into a float thing or into an integer thing, it could warn you. And so we started seeing errors, and the idea was, could somehow this be turned into a system to give us good information about the correctness of the program. So one of the champions of this idea was Robin Milner. Robin Milner designed a brilliant programming language called ML, which had a type inference engine in it, so you did minimal specification, and it would look at everything and try to figure out what the types of everything were, and it could give you warnings when it found inconsistencies. Milner made this claim for his type system that well-typed programs cannot go wrong. And he meant this as um, an anthem, you know, as a slogan that will go marching down the streets. Well-typed programs cannot go wrong. And we would all, and it turns out this is completely wrong. Uh, it, it's not true. And, and he wasn't even talking about Java-style types, which he would consider to be total crap. He was talking about his ML type inference types, that he thought he had enough formal theory behind it to prove things about programs, and it turned out he couldn't, because the number of things that can go wrong in a program is vastly bigger than what a type system is going to look at. That's not to say that type systems aren't useful, but he made a promise that his type system couldn't keep. And in fact, there are people working today in dynamic languages who have um, determined that most of the arguments about whether or not you should have static typing mostly go back to Milner and are making his theoretical claims, um, but not actually providing enough value to be worth the effort. So we get another of these debates. And so if you ever wondered what's it like to be in one of these things, we're in one right now. In fact, we're always in at least one of them. There are usually several going on at the same time. Um, so in this one, we got the radicals again who are saying that the type systems in languages like Java are not worth the freight, that they require a lot of specification, a lot of ceremony, and um, the claims about the value of the types is way overblown. They don't do as much good as is claimed. Then you got the reactionaries saying, wait a minute, um, it requires little effort to use these types, it's just writing down work that you're going to do anyway, not recognizing, in fact, that those guys don't do that work. They can't, these guys don't know how much pain they're in, how much unnecessary work they're doing, because it's part of their model. They haven't been on the other side of the paradigm yet. And they're also suspicious of these guys. The type system is there to help you. Why aren't you smart enough to understand that? Um, you know, so, you know, again, talking across each other. Then the moderates, 
to, you know, we're the voice of reason, let's all be practical here. And they say, it should be optional. You know, you can work in a strongly typed language or in a loosely typed language. It's a matter of taste, which is also wrong. You know, so what, the, what they're saying is that there is, um, there is value, but they're not accounting for the cost. And so they're not making uh, a good balance. It, uh, the moderate argument is usually if there's some value there, then let's ignore the cost and, and say there's value and, and that's good. So, um, so we'll, we'll get back to this debate in a minute. So there, there's another debate that's happening that's related to this one but, or, but orthogonal, but it, the relationship is similar. Well, oh, let's just let's say it's the, the argument uh, between the people doing classical inheritance and prototypal inheritance. So prototypal inheritance is fairly unique to JavaScript. There aren't many other languages that would want to do that. Um, most of the other languages are doing this one. In fact, it is such a common thing that they don't even recognize the word classical. They think, you know, inheritance, it just works that way. They happen to use classes. They cannot imagine it working any other way. Um, I think that prototype, or I used to think prototypal inheritance was one of the good parts of JavaScript. Um, and that it's actually an advance over that one. That this one was invented first, this was invented second. The classical guys think this was a regression. I think it was a mistake, it was moving backwards. It was actually a positive step forward. Um, but that's not widely understood yet, even in the JavaScript committee. So back when the go-to debate was going on, uh, there was a joke about um, creating a come from statement Let's create the come from statement and then we can eliminate it. It turns out we have a come from statement. It's called extends. So uh, we tend to write software in layers, you know, because otherwise it gets too complex. And so one of the ways we manage the complexity is we I try to seal things into layers. The problem with that is because yeah, there's no perfect solution. Everything has trade-offs and the trade-off in the layer model is that if you make a, a mistake in one of the lower levels, one of the lower la layers, you're stuck with that because you get dependencies from the higher levels onto that one. And so not only can you not fix that one, that this error tends to propagate through all the higher levels as everybody is compensating for this badness. And the cost of repairing this stuff is enormous. It's so high that we usually uh, don't do it. So, and that results in brittleness and bugs, expensive maintenance and legacies, you know, all these problems come from that. So extends gives us another, an orthogonal um, axis on which we can do the same thing, where you tend to have very deep hierarchies and if you make a mistake in one of the deep ones, then that error propagates through everything else and, and you end up with hierarchies which are horribly misconfigured or you have to do a lot of refactoring in order to fix that. And generally the classical community doesn't see that as a problem because they think it's an inev inevitable part of life which is completely unavoidable. In fact, it is completely avoidable. So um, part of working in classes is you have to do classification. You have to look at all of the objects that are gonna be in your application and you have to figure out you know, you're one of those, you're one of those, and so on. And then you take those classes and you have to do the taxonomy. You have to figure out who is related to who, who inherits from what, so that you can figure out how the inheritances go, how, how the implementations go. Um, and at the part, you usually do it at the beginning of a project, at the time when you have the least understanding about how that's going to work. And then you make it and invariably you get it wrong because it's complicated and you don't have adequate information at the start and so you end up with a hierarchy which is incorrect. And now you either have to live with the wrong hierarchy, which is painful, or you have to refactor it, which is painful and risky. And that's life. And again, it's thought to be completely unavoidable except that it's completely avoidable. So in the, in the prototypal world, we don't do that. We just make an object if you like it you make more objects and say they're just like them, except they're different. And that's it. 
and you don't have to do the classification. You don't have to do the taxonomy. You tend not to go very deep. The inheritance, when it happens at all, tends to be very shallow. Um, and you don't have to do the refactoring. And you cannot tell the classical guys. They don't understand that. They hear the words, but because they've never experienced it, they hear it as something completely else, uh, something else. And so that argument continues. So I used to think that prototypal inheritance was one of the good parts of JavaScript. I'm not so sure about prototypal inheritance um, may have made sense in 1995 when JavaScript was introduced. The major benefit it provides is memory conservation, that um, you'll have lots of objects which are instances and they all inherit from a single prototype. And so the methods that are in the prototype are not replicated in all of the instances. And so there's a memory savings. And in 1995, that may have been important. We now have gigabyte memories. And so it's hard to imagine having enough objects that having each instance being fully populated would make any difference at all, ever. It, it just doesn't matter anymore. It's another of these things where a long time ago that level of efficiency meant something. And we completely missed the point where it stopped having any meaning. But we continue to optimize it for it, for it anyway because that's what we've been taught and that's what we do. And after we all are dead, then someone else will go, hey, you know, you, we didn't need to be doing that, and, and things will get more efficient. Um, in addition, so uh, that's the, the good part, which I think is not actually that good. Um, bad parts, uh, it's confusing. So we have own properties and inherited properties. And it's confusing when you ask object, what are thou? Um, it has th some kind of things, and it has these other kind of things, and just having those differences is a source of confusion, and confusion causes bugs, and that's bad. It also enables retroactive heredity, which means that you can go to any prototype and change it, and that instantly causes a change in everything that inherited from it. Um, that can obviously cause reliability problems, because you can have something that worked, and then suddenly everything in the system fails at once. Um, it's also a big performance problem that the people who are making JavaScript engines um, figured out that if they can make assumptions by observing the structure of objects, they can make programs go really fast. But if any prototype changes, boom, all bets are off and everything goes back to zero and everything goes slow. And in the worst case, they have to be prepared for that happening at any time. Between any two instructions, it's possible someone could change a prototype and then suddenly everything goes bad. Um, so it's inhibiting performance improvement, which um, is a concern because we're trying to get more performance out of this stuff. So um, I used to say that prototypal inheritance was one of the good parts. I'm now moderating that. I'm saying that class-free object-oriented programming is one of the best parts of JavaScript. Um, so in my own practice, I don't use new anymore ever. I haven't used new for years. I'm weaning myself off of this. I still use this a little bit, but very rarely. And I, I expect in a few years, I'll stop using it altogether. Um, so mostly what I'm writing is in a functional style, um, using the module pattern, um, building everything out of closures. So this is how I make objects. I'll have a constructor function. Um, it will take an, in, an initialization object. Um, I no longer want to write constructors that have multiple parameters because I can't remember what order things are in. And if I specify them as an object, then I can very easily deal with defaults and I can change the API later without breaking anything. I can also allow um, a deserialized JSON object to go into there. And so that gives me a lot of other options for how I can compose uh, new objects. Um, that will be the container of the new object that I'm making. Um, I can use a, another constructor to initialize it for me. That gives me some inheritance. I, I declare all of my members. These will be the private properties of the object. I declare my methods. These will be the private methods of the object. The methods will close over the initialization object, over um, the members and over the methods. Um, if I need for any of the methods to be public, I can attach them to that, and I return that, and I'm done. One of the nice things about 
uh, this particular pattern is I can take any of the methods in my object, remove it, call it independently, and it still works exactly the same. I can give this object to a bad guy, um, and he can replace methods, but he can't change the behavior of the object. It still works exactly as it did. I can take any of these methods, and I can call them as a function without having to use a bind method. So I can use them as callbacks. I can use them however I want. Uh, all the weirdness that happens with this is gone. So the objects are much more reliable. Now the problem with this is there is a cost that I have to make an ob a method or a function object for each method, and I have to store it in each object. And that costs some memory. Um, and if I suppose if you had a million objects, no, if you had a billion objects, you might notice that. Um, if you have significantly less than a billion objects, you probably won't. Well, I'd say a million, but it's it's still we got gigabytes now. It's 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 in the noise. So worrying about that cost of memory, particularly in in most applications, I see singletons or fewer than ten instances. Um, you know, but clearly, if you have millions, you know, who cares? Just just memory. Memory is cheap. We used to say memory is cheap as um, something that was ironically funny because it wasn't. Uh, today it is. We can't. How much does a bit cost? Can anybody do the math? It's 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 nothing. So I'm I'm optimistic that someday someone will figure out how to make the the types work so that um, we can keep Milner's promise. I would really like for what Milner said to be true, and if someone can figure out a way to make types do what he claimed, that would be great. And I would say, let's go strongly typed. Um, let's go static. It's worth it. But we're not there yet. Um, I, I hope we're there, but we're not. Um, uh, one other bit of history, functional programming. Functional programming has become very popular recently. And it's because it is the solution to a lot of the problems that we have. We're doing a lot of asynchronous programming now. And it turns out functional programming is really well suited to solving some of the problems that we have there. Um, and so uh, we've got JavaScript has has had functional programming from uh, from 1999. It's uh, in Python and Ruby. It's in C sharp. It's in uh, C plus plus. Has it? PHP has it in a half-assed way. Pretty much every language except Java has functional programming in it now. And even Java is likely to have it next year. So this is one of those overnight things, right? Well, no. OK, so functional programming starts in 1958 in Lisp. John McCarthy at MIT develops Lisp. Um, and um, he, it's intended to be an AI, AI language. Uh, they're going to do a lot of work on Lisp, on lists. Lisp stood for a list processing. Um, he added an idea called Lambda, which was taken from a paper by Alonzo Church. Um, McCarthy didn't really understand what Church was talking about, but some people said this Lambda idea is interesting, so he slipped it in. That turned out to be the whole reason to do Lisp. Um, and he had some other things called progs, which worked more like Fortran. That stuff's forgotten now. Everything is in Lambdas. Um, and the world takes absolutely no notice of it at all. Nothing. So the mainstream looks at the parentheses and go, what? Um, and, and ignored it. They assume, well, we understand the parentheses, so therefore we don't need it. Um, Milner does uh, ML in 1973, way ahead of his time design. Brilliant language. Eh, nothing. Um, 1975. Um, well, let me back up a couple years. So in 1971, Alan Case takes notice of a thing that was done in Norway, not far from here in Oslo. Uh, some guys put together a language called Simula. It was an, an Algol dialect which dealt with simulation, and they expressed the data that they were simulating as classes. This is the first time we did classes, and the world paid absolutely no attention, as, as always happens. Except for one guy. There's one guy in the world who noticed it. His name was Alan Kay. He was a student at the University of Utah. And he thought that this class idea, this object idea, 
was incredibly powerful. And he thought he could build a programming language for children out of this idea. He thought it was that powerful, that expressive. So he starts work on this language. Uh, he goes to uh, Xerox Park in Palo Alto, starts working there, and comes up with a prototype for a little language that he calls Smalltalk. He goes to MIT and shows them a demonstration of his prototype. And at that point, he hadn't fully thought the thing through right, and it was a really wacky little language. It got, But he spent almost a decade refining it. He spent almost as many years as Netscape spent days. Okay. And it shows, Smalltalk is a brilliant language. It's solid. It is so well thought out compared to JavaScript, which is challenged. Um, and so he goes to MIT and he's trying to explain how this object thing works. And it's difficult because he didn't have the vocabulary that we have now to describe what was going on. So he couldn't say, well, you invoke a method because you know, that, that didn't mean anything yet. So he described it as you send a message to an object. So the guys at MIT recognized, well, that's, it's not really sending a message. Um, it's an indirect subroutine invocation. Um, but then one of them, Carl Hewitt, started thinking, well, what would happen if we actually did send messages? So he had this idea, OK, we'll have computation, and we'll have these computational agents that we call actors, and they can send messages to each other. What would that be like? And he came up with the actor model, the same actor model that uh, Akka and a few other guys are doing. Hewitt comes up with that in the early 70s. There are a lot of, uh, Carl Hewitt is one of these guys who is so smart He's, you know, a couple levels at least above me, probably most everybody else. You know, and there were guys at MIT who just couldn't understand what Carl was talking about. He was making these amazing claims for what actors could do, and nobody, you know, they recognize there is this paradigm problem. Carl was born on the other side of the paradigm shift, so he's got no problem thinking this stuff. And the other guys are going, he, he is so smart. He must be onto something, but we can't figure it out. So. Uh, Sussman and Steele decide, let's try to implement his model. And maybe after we've implemented it, we can experience and then we'll understand what he's talking about. So they started writing a program called Schemer, and which implemented a subset of Carl's model. And in the process, they invented a new programming language called Scheme. Uh, Scheme has uh, functions with lexical closure, which turns out to be the right way of writing functions turns out they've been doing it wrong at MIT since 1958. Uh, with the invention of Scheme, they finally discover how to do it right. And it's like, we finally perfected object-oriented programming. It actually anticipates stuff that uh, Milner was doing, or, or learns from stuff that Milner was doing. Um, and there was a, a, a theoretical language before that called, um, uh, I forget what it was called, but it, it, it was not influential because they didn't pay any attention to it. They had to rediscover it for themselves. But eventually they did. And the world took absolutely no notice again. So it's like, we finally have it. Um, except that the eventually it finds its way into Common Lisp. So Common Lisp uh, adopts Scheme's way of doing functions, which is good. Uh, it gets adopted into Haskell. And again, mainstream doesn't care. It's not until JavaScript. You know, the world's most misunderstood programming language happens to implement this stuff. And now that JavaScript has it, suddenly it's cool. And everybody's doing it. And, and it only took, what, 50 years or no, 60 years? It's, it's, this stuff is not fast. It takes a long, long time. And so it's not like somebody had the insight and then, boom, the whole industry moves. It turns out most of what we're struggling with um, happened in the 50s. There was a, the um, computer science was brand new then, and people discovered a lot of stuff. And most of what we're dealing with today are either the very good ideas they had then or the very bad ideas that they had then. Not much original since then. Um, and we're still, uh, it's worth understanding our own history because a lot of what they were thinking about should inform what we should be thinking about. So the thing that most makes it most difficult for us to go forward is we have a difficult time seeing the difference between a paradigm shift in a really bad idea. We just cannot tell the difference in either direction. Sometimes we'll adopt bad ideas, and 
turns out they're bad ideas, and sometimes we'll reject good ideas because we cannot tell the difference. And that's, that's who we are. That's what we do. Um, one final thing before um, I leave you. So um, four years ago, um, uh, PC39, which is the committee that is responsible for ECMAScript, sort of reorganized itself around the Harmony project and um, decided to change the way that the, the committee did work. So um, it took 10 years between the third edition and the fifth edition. The fourth edition was abandoned. So we went 10 years without revising the standard. And we realized that that was a mistake, particularly in that the language had since then become really important, um, wildly popular, um, and its defects are becoming more and more obvious. So we needed to be faster, more responsive. So um, uh, 10 years ago, the committee decided that, or four years ago, we decided 10 years was too long. So we proposed that the next edition would be two and a half years. And at that time, four years ago, I predicted it will probably take longer because it always does. So uh, that was four years ago. Um, next month at my office at PayPal, uh, we're having the last meeting of the year for TC39. And we're going to be looking at EES6. And if we're able to finish it at that meeting, then we can publish it December of next year. It, it's going to take that long to test it and get it ratified by uh, the ECPA General Assembly. There is a lot of stuff which still hasn't been nailed down. So if we're unable to triage, then there's a good chance we're going to slip another year. And if we do that, it means it's going to be six years since we said 10 years was too long. Um, <laughs> um, so how could you help? I don't know. Um, I, I really don't know. Um, so that's it. So uh, thank you very much. It's been great being here. And all right. <laughs>